Hello and welcome to, uh, to this study and intercession and a segment that we're doing called Power and Authority of the Intercessor. And uh, we're going to be discussing that. We, we thank you for joining us uh, through Facebook Live. And uh, please make a point to share the video uh, with uh, your pastors and uh, your friends, especially in, uh, in India. I want to greet um, Pastor uh, Bopani there in uh, Mumbai. And uh, he has added some more churches to, to Omega even this week, I think three or four more. And uh, thank you very much for, for your work there, uh, Pastor Bopani. And we can't wait to meet and to, uh, uh, to see you and to see all these pastors and impart something of the power of the Holy Spirit to you. And uh, Pastor Eric, we want to greet you, the uh, flagship there in East Africa, Mombasa. Uh, praise God for you. And uh, I saw some photos of the, your recent uh, Sunday service, and you are, your sanctuary is so full. And I uh, just remember uh, just a couple of years ago, you were moving in, and uh, uh, just praise God for what He's doing with you. And uh, we, we ask God to continue to bless you and Pastor Lucy and uh, all of those there in Mombasa. Uh, you, you're, uh, uh, you're very near to our, to our hearts. Praise the Lord. So tonight we're going to begin to discuss power and authority and in intercession. Uh, but as we do this, we're going to need to involve some other concepts uh, as well because they're interwoven. We can't talk about power and authority of, uh, of an intercessor without uh, touching on some other things. So um, I, I made up rule of mine, rule number 27, we'll call it, uh, says that when you attack our adversary, uh, be prepared to be attacked. So when you attack someone, uh, bottom line, be prepared to have some retaliation coming your way. Uh, a principle of spiritual warfare is that our adversary, the devil, uh, you know, the devil is a word meaning slanderer, and uh, he is an adversary, uh, he is a liar, uh, but he does not willingly give up territory. So can we maybe start with some basic agreements here when we're discussing spiritual warfare, uh, as we mentioned in prior sessions, when you look around at this world, is this world uh, more uh, converted or is this world more lost? It's more lost, right? So uh, that means that territory is already in the hands of the enemy. So when we're going to take territory back, uh, that is going to be a fight that's going to ensue and our adversary does not just leave okay i know many people may have been taught that that you're king's kids and all of these things and that when you uh you make your request known to the lord, uh, to the lord that the devil just flees and leaves the territory and that's not the uh, uh that that's not the case so um as much as it's been within your ability so these are some other ground rules for fighting and for intercession as much as it is in your ability to do it is important to you that you ensure that there is no justification for the enemy attacking you. In this world, the Bible says you're going to have much trouble. And the Bible says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Speaking of God, Jesus has overcome the world. However, this world and your life, spirit, soul, and body operate under certain biblical principles. And a lot of times I think the body of Christ is confused because they say, oh, I don't know, I'm in spiritual warfare and uh, I can't seem to make any headway. And uh, th the answer may be as simple as stop sinning. Okay? When you sin, you give the ability for your adversary to take and keep territory on the inside of you. Okay, so there is nothing, there is no prayer, there is no prayer service, there is no pastor, there is no evangelist, there is no prophet that can pray for you if you've willingly uh, embraced sin inside of your life that is going to alleviate that uh, from, from your heart and life. Uh, you're, you're asking people to pray for no, for no reason. They're going to be exhausting prayers uh, on your behalf and it's not going to accomplish anything. You have to take control of your life and, and have the authority that God's given you over your own vessel and you've got to rid yourself of, uh, of the involvement of, of hell. So you want to be able to stand righteous before God when the enemy is slinging his arrows. Now, this is balanced out. So please, please understand me. I'm not saying that if you're struggling with something and that you need some help, that God can't help you until you get it right yourself. That is impossible. If you could get something right yourself, then we wouldn't have needed Christ to die for us. 
Okay, so uh, you have to balance these things out. But if you're looking for solutions in your life spiritually, and God has told you to take care of certain things, and you are refusing to fight those battles and take care of those things, um, you, you're, you're going to have uh, some difficulty. It reminds me of the anecdote that uh, Dr. Michael Brown would say of some of his students in Bible college. And uh, uh, he said early on, one of his students came and talked to him and said, uh, Dr. Brown, I'm having trouble with, with lust. And uh, Dr. Brown says, you know, we'll pray about it and some of those things and gave him some advice. He came back later, said, I'm still having trouble uh, with lust. And Dr. Brown says, well, tell me what you've been doing. Well, I've been praying and I've been, and he says, well, you know, you're, you're doing the right things. He said, so uh, when do these feelings come upon you? What's going on? What's the situation? He says, well, every time I go to the beach, I'm hanging out with all my friends and I'm seeing all these people everywhere, you know, and they're in their, uh, you know, skimpy attire. And Dr. Brown said, stop going to the beach problem solved, okay? Uh, so, sometimes, though, it doesn't penetrate through our minds and our hearts that there's something else that we've got to do besides just asking the Lord to make us, uh, uh, you know, concrete statues or something, and, and that's, uh, that, that's not, going to, not going to happen. So, in particular, let me hit on a couple of things. I told uh, a story about a young, unknown college student, so now let's make it a little closer to home. In particular, I'm just going to get right to it. Some of the things that will hinder uh, the Spirit of God moving through you in power and authority. Uh, fact of the matter, number one, is pride. You harbor pride inside of your heart and inside of your life. Uh, you, you are not going to, uh, to, to be able to, to walk in, in continuous victory. Hidden sin. Things that are inside of your life and inside of your heart that uh, uh, you recognize are there, uh, but you, you, don't, you haven't confessed, you, you haven't uh, set up a, a guard or some accountability around you in, in that area, um, you, you've got something that's hidden. Uh, you don't want to be giving the enemy an open door by our own sinful behavior. Believe me, we have enough problems in this world as it is without inviting difficulty. Okay. Next, I want to talk about offense. How many of you have been offended in the last month? Yeah, you know, uh, a great tool. I'm not here to talk about this tonight, but a great tool for you to walk through is uh, John Bevere's book, uh, Offense, The Bait of Satan. Uh, read it, study it, and don't just let it go. Oh, I know some people that need to read that. Uh, examine it from the inside of your own heart to ensure that you aren't harboring offense. If our enemy can establish an offense within your spirit, he will significantly decrease your ability to pray and he will hinder your spiritual walk. I don't care how much spiritual experience you have. If you've got offense in your life, uh, your walk with the Lord and your power and authority are hindered. I don't care how many sermons you've heard, nor how many sermons you've preached in your life. If you are a heart or a spirit that is offended, you are not going to have any spiritual power and you're not going to walk in victory. Keep yourself free from offense and stand ready to give genuine forgiveness. Now, everybody here will say, oh, I used to have offense and I used to deal with that and, you know, I, I'm beyond that now. That's always the response that, that I hear. Uh, so let me, let me give you some examples so that you can examine your heart and see if there's maybe some offense still there. Uh, tell me this, what consumes your thoughts? If it's something that somebody else did to you when you were 12 or 15 or last week or whatever uh, and it's consuming you, Oh, it's not consuming me, you know. How many times do you think about it a day? Oh, just two or three, you know. It's consuming you, okay? You say, oh, well, it's not really, it's not in my thoughts. I've mastered that. Is it consuming your conversations? Think about that offense that's in your heart. Are you talking to people on the phone about it? Are you emailing people about it? Are you texting people about it? Then it's consuming you. You've got an offense, You've got something against your brother or your sister. Uh, how much time do you tell, uh, retell the stories that are in some cases decades old? Yeah, that's huh? Yeah. That's good. How many times are you doing that? Well, if you're over it, why are you talking about something that happened 40 years ago? Right. I remember it like I was yesterday. You're still offended. Fall on your face before God and ask him to help you with this. Obviously, it's not something that you've been able to, to take care of. There's no shame in that. We can't take care of these things. And the devil wants to worm them in and, and make them so interwoven with the fabric of you 
that you recognize it not as an offense. You think it's a part of you and you think it's a, anybody would do the same thing in your, in your circumstances. The devil's already won in that situation. And from then on, all you have are words that you're having power and authority, but you have no deeds or actions corresponding to that power and authority. And I can think of very few things as empty feeling as all I have is the ability to talk about the principles of God, but I don't have any real life power examples as a result of that. I'm trying to save us from, uh, fr from that. Um, another word about offense, another tell about offense. Um, do you feel as if somebody owes you something? An apology. And you're waiting for someone to say sorry. I can nearly 100% guarantee you that that person has no idea that you're expecting an apology from them. But see, it's called debt collecting. So-and-so owes me something. And so they don't give you what you need. Not only are you mad and not only are you offended by that, but what do you start doing? Every time you're around them, you're waiting for them to pay you what they owe you. And the more that they don't, the more frustrated you are about all kinds of things in their behavior that have nothing to do with, with anything. Somebody else would listen to it and say, well, you know, no, they weren't sliding you. I was right there. Oh, no, they slided me. They, oh, they slided me. They walked right past. They didn't shake my hand, didn't even look at my eye. Uh, that's not the way I saw it, and I was standing right there. But, you know, you need to check yourself for what's going on on the inside because that's an over-the-top reaction. What are you doing? You're debt collecting. You're saying they owe me that apology. They owe me an explanation. They owe me this, uh, that, or the other. Anytime you're putting yourself or someone else in that position, uh, they owe me respect. You have assigned them a debt that, again, they're probably unaware that they owe. We hold it against them, and then when they don't pay off, we find ways to make them pay. And then everybody looks at you and says, well, you're the one with the problem. They don't know what's going on here, but all they see is your behavior is erratic. Well, why did you do that? Hmm, well, you know, they deserve it. I'm paying them back what they owe me. You see, and you fight this imaginary battle with someone else. You know, it's so much easier to say, Father, remove offense from my heart. Forgive me. I don't want to harbor any of this. I want my heart to be free from any weight, any care, any concern. All I want to do is think about your kingdom. All I want to do is meditate about you and your word and, and, and build your, your body. That's all I want to do. See, forgiveness releases us from the need to get even or even being owed an apology. And that's how you know you've really forgiven someone. Anybody can say, oh, yeah, I've forgiven them. That's the Christian thing to do. I, I've done it lots of times. I've forgiven them. You know? uh, well, then why in the world are you still talking about it? If it's over, it's over. You don't have to drag somebody else through the mud or talk about them or make them look low so that you look superior and you look righteous and you look like, oh, the poor victim that's gone through. You don't have to do that if you've forgiven somebody. You don't even remember. How would it be if God treated you that way? And when you came to him and said, oh, but God, this and that, and God says, you know what? I've forgiven you. Oh, it's as far away as from the east and the west, but I don't trust you. And I'm not going to give any of my presence to you, any of my power to you. You're going to have to earn your way back to me, buddy. You know, how would, it, how would you feel if God did that to you? And yet that's what we do to other individuals. We don't give others what they've received. The devil loves to get the body of Christ in this position because you become paper tigers. Oh, all the talk, Rawr, I'm a king's kid. Oh, we're going to praise our way into victory and we're going to do this and we're going to, oh, this is going to be great, that and the other. And the devil sits back and laughs, knowing you will never have any power and you will never have any authority. You will have nothing but words because he's harbored an offense inside of you and got you shut up and bound up and so that you aren't able to provide this to, uh, to another individual. Forgiveness releases us from a position of ownership, um, there's no reason to get back at someone. The issue is dead. It's sent away. It's washed under the blood. So when we attack Satan, be aware of his retaliation. Do not fear his retaliation. This is the other pitfall the church gets into. They start talking about how bad the devil is and how terrible he is. Yes, he is. That's Satan, the adversary, the devil. You know, none of those are good characteristics of an individual. He is an evil being, but he is not anywhere near the greatness and the excellency of God. When you ascribe 
a greater ability of Satan to harm you than of God to rescue you, you have ascribed to Satan the power and the character of God. You can't do it. You can't do it. You've made Satan an idol that you call God. Okay? Uh, uh, this does not mean that then around you go around and dress up in camouflage and sneak around and always be paranoid. The devil's over here. The devil's over there. I got to watch out for all of this stuff. That wouldn't be an example of fear. You are ascribing to the devil greater power than he has. The devil wants all of you dead. Okay? He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants all of you dead. If he could do it, he would have done it already. He doesn't have the power to destroy without things going through God. God's got the power of life and death. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. Let me give you an example of something that I hope will make a picture clear for you. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. This is at the end of the uh, um, uh, history of human history as we know it. It says this, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Pre pretty straightforward scripture, right? This is talking about at the millennial reign, the beginning of Christ's reign on earth. Okay, But something I want you to notice here. How many angels come and subdue the devil? One. It's never been about strength and never been about power. When it's time for his season to be over and he's going to be bound for a thousand years, all it takes is one angel carrying out the authority and the instructions of heaven. Why in the world do you live in fear of this animal? Keep that picture in your mind. I can tell you there was a time when I first uh, gave my heart and life to the Lord that I was plagued with, uh, with fear, and I can remember waking up uh, uh, consistently in the middle of the night in terror, absolute terror, feeling evil inside of my room. Um, you know, Satan was, uh, uh, or, or a, a, a demon or something, was certainly uh, having an assignment to try and stir things around. And uh, sometimes I couldn't talk, I couldn't move, uh, paralyzed. Here I am thinking I'm uh, 21, 22 years of old, and those are things that little kids do. And here I am experiencing this thing. I couldn't rationalize it away. I, I, I knew it didn't make sense, and yet there it was, okay? Uh, it got so that uh, at the beginning when I couldn't even say anything, I would just begin thinking in my mind, Jesus, I need help, Jesus. I need help. Uh, and then gradually uh, that would move to, uh, uh, you know, being able to get up and pray and then getting some victory and then going back to sleep. Uh, I, I can tell you that after uh, a short time of this, uh, I'm an individual that loves my sleep. And so I, I, I can't keep, uh, keep doing things that way for sure. Um, that I, I found the passage talking about how uh, uh, the devil at the end of the era is going to be uh, destroyed and thrown in the lake of fire with Satan, uh, with, the, with the false prophet and his angels. And uh, that, that's what the lake of fire was created for and uh, it gave me great pleasure to know that the torture of my soul was going to uh, have such a demise and so it got so uh, that whenever uh, this would begin to come uh, into the room I would have my Bible open on the pillow next to me and I wouldn't even have to get up anymore I would just point at the uh, passage there and say uh, yeah, you're getting in some licks right now, but uh, for all of eternity, this is where you're headed. And I'm telling you, uh, gone out of the room in, in just a moment. So I, I, I say that then to follow into another example. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth uh, would often tell of the account of, uh, of how he would handle uh, the attacks of the, of the enemy. Uh, he said he would wake up in the middle of the night and he relayed this story. There was a commotion in the house and uh, he heard banging down uh, in his uh, kitchen and downstairs and it was uh, louder and louder and things were getting crazy and he's trying to sleep upstairs and uh, finally he sets up in bed and looks at the foot of his bed and he said he saw uh, what he believes to be the devil himself uh, not just uh, a demon but the devil himself standing at the foot of his bed and he said uh, uh, oh it's just you, it's just you. Yeah. 
and rolled over and went back to sleep. Okay, uh, this is the example of an individual uh, who understood that he didn't have to be in terror of an enemy that one angel is going to subdue uh, for, for a thousand years. Get this into your spirit. Okay, it doesn't mean the attacks aren't real, and it doesn't mean you're not going to have to walk down some dark areas, and it doesn't mean that everything's going to be great, and your 401k is always going to be overflowing, and so on and so forth, uh, and that you won't ever have a broken bone, and you won't ever have any suffering in this life, quite the opposite. Uh, it just means that whatever you go through, you don't have to be concerned about what our enemy is going to do. Uh, be concerned about being right with God. Yes. Amen? Amen. Okay, uh, three sources of trials that you're going to receive in this life, uh, Satan, uh, the world, and the flesh. Okay, it's going to be important that you recognize the difference and have some discernment between the three. Not everything you face in your life is a result of satanic oppression. Okay? Okay. First uh, Thessalonians says we are appointed for affliction. And Paul is writing the church in Thessalonica and says, so if you're experiencing affliction, do not be shaken. This is part of it. The word appointed, there is an expectancy. This is what you are, are, are set up for, is that there's going to be some, uh, uh, s some affliction. Uh, you know, you hear all the time, oh, Satan opposed me here. And, and uh, you, you hear also, you know, that, that this is, sometimes it's just your flesh opposing you. Yes. Yeah. Learn discernment between the three. Because if it's not Satan and it's your flesh, it doesn't do any good to tear down the works of Satan in your life. You've got to tear down your flesh. See, you're praying against the wrong things. God can't answer until there's, uh, uh, there, there's some ownership there for what's really, uh, what's really going on. So how do you overcome uh, or res uh, Satan, the world, and the flesh? It's easy. You resist Satan, you persevere over the world, and you sow to the spirit instead of the flesh. Okay? Resist Satan. The Bible says he'll flee. Number two, you, you want to uh, get over the world or get, uh, get through? Persevere over it. Sometimes you're going to have to go through some stuff. Go through it righteously. And number three, if your flesh is giving you trouble, the Bible says so to the spirit and not the flesh. So you're going to have to build up your spirit person. How do you do that? You pray in the spirit. You confess your sin. You draw near to God. And you, you, uh, you, you pummel your flesh. You starve it. Fasting is a, a, good, uh, a good tool there as well. And we'll have a, a session on that in a, uh, in a few weeks. Why doesn't God just remove the retaliation of Satan? Right? There's the, the $2 million question. Why doesn't he just remove it so that you don't have to deal with it? He can't go against his, uh, against his word. He can't go against his word. But there are also valuable things that happen when you're in trials. You know, trials are the great auditor of your life. Now, if I were to ask you to self-evaluate yourself, that's why I'm not a huge fan of self-evaluations. Uh, I do them, and I have a self-evaluation form that I used to handle my, uh, hand to my interns uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis, and it was always with great uh, joy that I would look at their responses and their answers, and uh, it's just interesting to see how people view themselves. Uh, but if, if all you have is a self-evaluation, uh, you, you, aren't, you aren't playing with an auditor. You got to have somebody come along and evaluate the work. Otherwise, you know, everybody pronounces themselves as good and deserving, uh, you know, the highest raise that you can get, and you're in the best category. You know, and I'm doing right, and this measure and that measuring stick. First uh, Peter chapter one verse three tells us some some very wonderful things here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance imperishable and undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in which you rejoice greatly, although now for a short time, if necessary, you are distressed by various trials. Let me pause there for just a moment. Various trials, their design is to distress you. Okay? So if you're feeling distressed, it does not mean that God has forsaken you. 
Sometimes you're distressed as you go through various trials. Now, here's the purpose. So that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold that is passing away, but is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom although you have not seen, you love, and whom now you believe, although you do not see him, and you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Our behavior when we are attacked by Satan is the best indicator of where we stand before God. This is how you know. Oh, I'm super Christian. I've been saved for 10 years and uh, I've been to this spiritual retreat and I've been there and I've seen miracles and I've done this and I've read the Bible through at least one time a year, uh, you know, for the last decade. Uh, but, you know, right now I'm full of bitterness and I'm full of oppression and I'm bound up and uh, uh, I'm having trouble in this area of my life. I'm having trouble in that area of my life. But don't look at that. Pay no attention to that. I'm one of God's favorite children because I've been with him for so long and I know so much. See, you self-evaluated your Yourself as a spiritual giant, but you're not enduring trials. And there's a pin drop. I just heard it right over there in the corner, a pin drop. This is the reality check that God needs his body to know. Because this is mercy, guys. This is mercy. If he doesn't tell us this, we're going to step into eternity and that's going to be the first time we hear it. How cruel would that be? But he tells us ahead of time, your faith isn't working. Not to condemn us, but because he knows that he has something of a greater nature to deposit inside of you. And he's wanting you to reach out to him and say, oh, uh, I need to, I got a leak over here. You know, I need to patch that leak. I need this to be fixed. I, I need this to be taken care of. You know, this is what he's after when we start looking at these, uh, uh, these opportunities. It, the reality check is not much different than a college athlete. How cruel would it be if a college athlete was not told up front, uh, you know what, the pros is a very serious thing. And I'm telling you right now, you don't have the speed and you don't have the size to play this position in the NFL. How cruel is it to let the guy go through? I don't have to go to class. I don't have to study. I'm here on a scholarship. I'm going to graduate in four years, but I'm never going to need that. All I'm going to do is go in the NFL. I'm going to make millions of dollars and get all kinds of endorsements. How cruel is it if there's not a reality check saying it doesn't measure up? Oh, no, it does measure up. I'm fast. I'm quick. I'm that. And then what do you do? You bring out the tape. Let me show you. You got beat on this play. You got beat on this play. Your technique's not right here. Your technique's not right there. I'm not saying this to hurt you. I'm telling you this because the tape's not lying. It's telling what actually happened. See, that's what the trials are for us. It's God showing us the tape. Here's how you just did. Here's how you just did. This is the video evidence of your life. Let's go back and rehearse that last month. Let's go back and rehearse that last interaction. Here's what I say in my word that you should do and how you should behave. And here's what you just did. Okay, so um, these are the reality checks that, that, uh, that we need. The evidence will often defy delusion, and that's what we're after. We need the evidence that comes from the throne so that we don't continue on as that individual. And so if we continue on, we never improve. And what are we about? We're about getting better. We're about getting closer. We're about getting more and more pure, more and more holy so that God can place himself inside of us and build something for, for his glory. So all of that is the foundation that we have needed to talk about power and authority. Because everybody wants to talk power and authority and they want to have power and authority, but they don't want to do any of the stuff that we just talked about. You cannot get it any other way. You cannot get power and authority by taking an eight-hour online class and they stamp it and say, now go get your license for power and authority. You cannot get power and authority that way. You cannot get it by enduring 52 years of sermons. You know, oh, I've been to camp meetings. I've been to this. I've been to that. I've got 52 years of sermons under my belt. I've heard everybody preach from coast to coast. I've done this. I've, done, I've read all the right books and all these things. You cannot get your power and authority card by enduring those things. Okay, It comes from a very specific uh, way of behaving in the presence of the Lord and growing. But the good news is, is it doesn't take 52 years. Thank God. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah. Matthew 10, chapter 1. And summoning his 12 disciples, 
he gave them authority over unclean spirits so that they could expel them and could heal every disease and every sickness. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Now, I, I need to say a few things about this before we move on. Take a guess at how long the disciples had been with Jesus before this event happened. What's that? Just about. Not even. Not even. About a year. About a year was the response. Sorry for those that are watching on, on video there. Uh, yeah, not, not even. Not even a full year. And here he is gathering his 12 together and saying, you've seen me do this, now I'm giving this same thing to you. Now listen to this. He gave them authority. I need you to pay. This is very, very critical. Authority over unclean spirits to do what to them? To expel them. Okay, now this is important because there's a lot of junk out there and I'm speaking to those that are watching from overseas as well. India, Africa, pay attention. There's a lot of misinformation out there. He gave authority to expel them, not to reason with them, not to convert them, not to ask them what their name is, not to see what they want to do here or want to do there, but to expel them. That's the extent of your authority. Let's hear the amens from, uh, yes, thank you. And uh, overseas, you type your amens in <laughs> as you watch this later because none of you are off the hook here. Um, Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Oh, let me back up. I'm sorry. Well, we, okay, thank you. He, he's, he's on. Okay, let, let me back up. So authority over unclean spirits so they can expel them. Number two, what's the authority for? Heal every disease. Heal every disease. Every disease and every sickness. You see it there? Okay, so those are two things that he has called us to do. Does this mean that, wait a minute, what if it's uh, stage four cancer? Do we have authority for that? Okay, what if it's AIDS? Do we have authority for that? What if it's COVID? Do we have authority for that? Okay, because it says every, and every is a pretty specific. In Greek, it means every. Okay, it means everything. All right. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And summoning the twelve... He gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So there's some overlap there. Power and authority over all the demons. Not just that there are certain kinds that you have power and authority over and you've got to find out what, what strata they're in and what hierarchy they're in. And then I mean to call summoning angels from God to combat here. You are not the maestro of spiritual warfare where you're conducting this and conducting that and moving this. God takes care of all of those things in his kingdom. Your job is simply to drive them out where you see them. Amen. Okay? Number two, to cure diseases. And then three, sends them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. So you are called and have authority to proclaim the kingdom of God. Amen? So these are areas that God is moving in your life. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 20. I don't have the scripture, but it is a similar passage to Matthew chapter 10, except for they are sending out the 72. And the paraphrase of Luke chapter 10, 1 through 20 is, Look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes, scorpions, crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. I say all of these things to say this statement. The intercessor's authority comes from God. Not from Bible school. Not from having a five-year prayer life. You know, that certainly helps. But your authority is given to you by God. If it's given to you by God, it can't be taken away by anybody but God. Or your own behavior. Okay? Authority, then, when we look at the definition scripturally. I'm not talking about a, a uh, dictionary definition. I'm talking about a scriptural definition. And authority is the right to do a thing. And by the way, I don't often use modern day dictionary definitions to interpret uh, Greek and Hebrew words uh, from the Bible that's at least 2,000 years you know, and, and older. The reason being is words change meaning. 
And so a lot of times we talk about a word in our dictionary, we go to the dictionary and look it up and okay, yeah, I understand what that word means. But what it means to you has nothing to do with the way it's used in scripture a lot of times. Okay, so that's why I don't, I don't often do that. I just wanted to, to, to give you that. Um, so these verses and others give to us our right or our legal authority to act within the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 10, Luke 10, Luke 9, and there are others throughout Scripture. Those are just three. How many verses do you think you need? I mean, we need one, right? Take it in context. And yet I've already given you three, and there are more that you're going to find if you start looking at that, okay? Looking at, uh, at how these things transition. Okay, so uh, if you want to learn about and walk in the authority of God, you're going to understand that it's giving me my legal right to act, my legal right to do what God says I can do, because I can only do what God says I can do. I can't do what I want to do or how I feel like a situation should turn out. Amen. You don't have fire, uh, authority to call fire down on your enemies. Amen, Pastor. That's right. Amen. Uh, uh, so let's go back and do a little bit of an origin story here to put authority in proper perspective. Now, we all know, I think everybody here knows, and I hope those that are watching on, online know, we all know that authority was first given to Adam, right? Yeah. At creation. Amen? Yeah. Okay. In Genesis 1, uh, uh, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, authority was given, and the phrase is there that I've heard frequently, I've heard often throughout churchdom, and it goes something like this. We are called to subdue and have dominion over everything. Right? You heard that? Okay. And that's true. You can't argue with scripture. It's there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. However, what happened to the authority given to Adam and Eve? They gave it away. And who did they give it away to? Satan. Satan. Okay. So then the whole world's destroyed. And then you have Noah receiving the command of God again in Genesis chapter 9. And it's important to note that in Genesis chapter 9, there's, there's, there's something different. Did I have uh, Genesis 1? 28 in there? Let's, let's look at Genesis 1, 28. I have that. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and birds of heaven and over every animal that moves upon the earth. Okay. So you have these wonderful power words in there. Subdue, overcome, rule, dominate. You know, you got all those things. Genesis chapter nine, when he's giving these commands to Noah about be fruitful and multiply. That's all it says. Be fruitful and multiply. Why? The dominion, the rule, the authority, it's lost. Important to note, the flood didn't wipe that out. So all this stuff of going through and saying, oh, we're just subdue in every place we step here and there, we're dominating, we're doing that, we're doing that. You're wasting your time. This world is not going to get better and better and then Jesus returned to a world that's perfect. The Bible indicates this world is going to get worse and worse until Jesus steps in and says enough. Okay, so many like to teach and preach about dominion as if we're many rulers of our own domain. And this is ironic because many of us can't rule over our finances. We can't rule over our thoughts, our passions. We can't rule over a lunch order and a drive through let alone a spiritual kingdom. You order at the drive through and by the time you get to the window, you want to add five things to it and take three things away. You couldn't rule over it. You didn't know what you wanted to do. And yet you're going around trying to do dominion over this, dominion over that. You're deluding yourself. I'm just trying to save us some time. Okay. Jesus has given us authority. We are to rule over our emotions, our thoughts, our actions, not people. Okay. Another word, another phrase for this is you are responsible to people, not for them. Okay. I can't be responsible no matter how hard I pray. I cannot be responsible for what anybody else does. I am responsible to them. I'm responsible to care for them, provide them with honest information, to present that information in love, to lift them up every time that they come across my heart. I am called to be, uh, uh, behave in them like Christ behaves. I'm called to do all of those things. Okay? But I am not called to be responsible for them. I cannot control their behavior. And any attempt to control somebody else's behavior, even your spouse, even your family members through prayer, is witchcraft. 
You are trying to get God to manipulate. You're manipulating things, saying, make them like this, make them like that, do this, do that. You're telling God how they need to be. That is not our place. God has not called us to do that. He's called us. Remember the, the scope of authority. Preach the gospel. Drive out devils. Heal the sick. It doesn't say in there, and rule over people. And if you see them doing something that's not right, you go and tell them that's wrong and I'm calling out God against you. There's no, there's no basis for that in the word of God. You're wasting breath. You're wasting time. And time is probably the important thing there. So the point is this. Every victory that has been won spiritually since Noah has been the result of God's people knowing our authority and our mission and advancing it through war. Every victory. It's not been going around because we dominion this and we subdue this and we possess this and we do this. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus approached and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now listen to this. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days until the end of the age. What's missing here? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so I therefore give you all authority in heaven and earth. Do you hear that? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and do something very specific. I have all of the authority in heaven and earth, but I'm giving you a narrow mandate. Here is what you have the authority to do. He's not saying I surrender all the authority to you. Hmm. So, backing up, every mission that the people of God have won in the original testament and in the new has been because God gave them an express command. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Go do it. Case in point. When Israel's being led out of Egypt and they are told you are going to go and possess the promised land that I spoke to your fathers about. Okay? And there he says, every place the sole of your foot takes from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean is going to be yours. He didn't say Russia. He didn't say the area that's now China. He didn't say the area that they didn't even know about then that's now the United States. He didn't say any of those other areas. He said very specifically, this is the limit. So God wasn't even telling Israel that here's what you're going to do. You're going to go around and rule the world. Never said that. This is the area from the Euphrates all the way through uh, to, the, to the Mediterranean. That's going to be yours. And understand these words. You are going to possess that land. The word possess in Hebrew is the identical word to dispossess. And it's a word talking about inheritance. If you are going to claim your inheritance, you're going to possess your inheritance, the thing that God's given you to do in this life, in this generation. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to dispossess what is already on it. That's the warfare. When God brought Israel into the nation of Israel, into the land of Canaan, was it empty? No, it wasn't. They had to drive people off of it. Yeah. Did it belong to the people that, that, that were living there? They were living there, but God had said, no, I'm God. The whole earth is mine. I've taken it from them and I've given it to you. But God didn't remove the people that were on it. He required them to go to war and fight. And to the degree that these individuals went through and cleaned out their territory, that's the degree that they had peace in their tribe. Wow. Yes. Right. When they didn't clean out their area and take possession of it by dispossessing who was already there because they were lazy or tired or didn't have the stomach for it or didn't have the heart to do it or didn't have the faith to do it, for whatever reason, then those individuals stayed there, intermingled with them, and that caused Israel to sin and caused them to never really fully occupy their inheritance. Then you move into the judges and have problems. Then you move into the kings and have problems. The chronicles and have problems. The prophets and have problems all the way up until the time of Jesus until Israel fell in AD 72 and the temple with it. Okay? So this is what's at stake here. We have a limited scope of authority. All authority has been given to Jesus. He gives us the authority to advance his kingdom. 
The authority of the church as given by Jesus is to proclaim all the gospel, drive out demons, and heal the sick. That's it. That's it. You want power and you want authority, be agents of these things. You want power and authority, be agents of these things. It does no good to go to the Lord and say, I want power and authority over the atmosphere. I want power and authority uh, over uh, finances. I want power and authority over, um, oh, I don't know, to live my best life now or to build an international ministry or any such thing. You know, I frequently observe people wanting power and authority uh, uh, so that they can be big shots, so that they can have something. Okay. The motivation of why you come to the Lord for power and authority uh, is, is key. It's so key. Uh, save yourself in the kingdom of heartache uh, and, and keep the motivation pure and know what the word of God says. Not what you think it says, not what someone told you it says, uh, but know what the word of God says in the right context. And that's where your authority lies. I don't know anybody around the world that I've met that's in the body of Christ that would be saddened or feel unfulfilled if they were doing this on a consistent basis. So be fulfilled in this. This is what Christ is calling us to. Be fulfilled in this. Okay, so now we've talked about authority. That's the right to do something in the kingdom of God. We have to add to it power. Authority without power is futility. Authority is the right to do a thing and power is the force necessary to carry it out. I can have all kinds of authority, but if I don't have any power to back it up, what are people going to do? Okay, guys, now, now get off of my land. I'm going to say it nicely 73 more times. Get off my land. I don't want you here. I keep telling you, you shouldn't be here. But unless you have power to evict someone, What's the people who are squatting on your land going to do? Keep squatting. Keep squatting. Laugh at you. Right. Maybe end up beating you up. You know, you're going to be the one that suffers and, uh, and come out wrong in this deal. It's the same in any phase of life. Children, we hear a couple of them right now. Yeah. Do I have authority over the little darlings? I absolutely do. Right? And I can talk to them all day long about my authority and what will they do? Exactly. But until someone comes up and lays the pow-pow on them, you know, that, that, that's, that's what it is. Unless you, there's power, unless there's power behind something, you know, it's the same thing in work. It's the same thing with law. Police officers, oh, let's post the speed limit. Let's make the speed limit out here uh, 35 and 40, and everybody just needs to keep that speed limit. If you don't have enforcement, what happens? People are driving 70, 80, whatever they can get away with. Why? You know, as fast as they can control their car because there's no, there's no power to back it up. So you see where you have authority, that's, that's the good part. You got to know what it is that God's called you to do and what he has relinquished to you. This is the ability I'm giving you in the kingdom. Preach the gospel, heal the sick, drive out devils. Praise God for that authority. But you got to get some power. Without power, all you have is words. Without power, you become a laughing stock. Authority is the right to do a thing, and power is the force necessary to carry it out. I had some scriptures here, but I think I'm going to skip over them. You, you probably know this. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 20. Uh, God was uh, performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul uh, so that even handkerchiefs and work aprons and all that stuff were being uh, taken from him and touching the sick. Uh, so basically, he's making tents. And as he sweats, as he's doing this, you know, he would discard his work apron. Someone else would take it off. It was so full of uh, the essence of Paul. Through the, they would take that to a sick person and sick people were getting well. Now, this isn't a method that God is saying. Now, church, if you want to consider yourself spiritual, you do the same thing and pray over all these cloths and then go and touch. I'm not saying that that can't work, but I'm saying nowhere in Scripture can you find God setting a pattern that says this is how he wants you to do things. Okay, stuff is done by the power of God through the authority that he has given you. Amen. The medium that that takes place is immaterial, pun intended, material. You see, you caught that material. It's a, yeah. Um, so all this stuff's happening, but what happened in this environment? You had seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, who went about and they said, we can do the same thing. 
And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I adjure you, you know, come out, you know, and all that. And they're trying to go through the motions. They're trying to use the authority. Had God given the believers authority? Absolutely. They have no power. The response is, Paul and Jesus, sure. I know Jesus, Paul I'm acquainted with. Who in the world are you? Disaster ensued. Okay, so uh, be, b this is the example of a lack of power to do a thing and really a lack of authority to do it. They probably weren't genuine believers to begin with. They just saw the show. They're the examples of people who wanted the power and authority to be a big shot. Look what we can do. Paul's getting all this notoriety. We want the, we want the same thing. So let me give you another example of Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, it's, it's Smith Wigglesworth night uh, here. So um, he uh, said that he was watching a... Um, uh, certain event. What, what he used to do is try and go to a, a city square and he would sit and wait for someone to, uh, God to lay somebody by his heart that he could preach the gospel to. I mean, he, he just, I want to see somebody converted. I know people are passing by every day, but their heart's got to be right. There's so many variables that are here. I don't want to just sow seed out there to the wind. I, I need it to take root. And, and so he would sit there and watch until the Lord just stirred his heart. And then he would say, that's the one. He would go and join himself to that individual and, and, and find a way to preach the gospel. But he was doing doing this and uh, he saw a lady who was trying to get out the front door of her house and and as she did uh, a little tiny dog he said you know kept following her down uh, the steps and she turned around and said you go home now you you get home and the dog ah, you know and walked back up the steps like it was going home and then she would go to the gate and the dog would you know come down and follow her again turn around now dog you know you need to get back to the home I'm talking to him real sweet and playing on the dog would wag its tail and be all excited you know and go back up the steps again she would open the gate and here comes the dog again you know coming down trying to follow her to wherever it is she's going finally she gets halfway down the sidewalk and Smith Wigglesworth said he's watching her and she turns and stamps her foot and says, you get back up in that house now. And the dog, rrr, 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 you know, and went and ran back up, right? What was different? The dog had an understanding that when that event occurred, the power is coming next to make the dog do what you're asking the dog to do. And it responded to that. Smith Wigglesworth's response that he writes, oh, he didn't write it. Somebody else wrote it about him as he was relaying the story. Uh, he said, now that's how you speak to the devil. The devil doesn't think you're serious and doesn't want to, uh, to listen to a thing in the world that you're having to say if all you're doing is saying, now, now go away and leave me alone. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from me. So you have to flee. He doesn't respect that. He doesn't respect you. He doesn't play nice. He respects the authority of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, period. The end. There is nothing else that he will respect. He doesn't respect your position, your Bible study, how much you know, how long you've been, and, and think. He doesn't respect any of that. He is looking for individuals who have the authority of God and know what that authority is and know how to use it. And also at um, uh, the... Um, the power that backs it up. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house? Now I'm going to try and walk through some principles here quickly. Jesus is telling an analogy here. He is talking about the way that he is driving out devils is being accused of him that he's doing it by the power of Satan that he's not really driving out devils, that he's working with Satan, and that's how he's getting this done. That's how twisted the response was to the work of Christ. Jesus said, first of all, that house can't be divided or it's not going to stand anyway, and none of us have anything to worry about. But he said, if someone walks into a house and there's someone there that's a very physically powerful man. Forget the term strong man for a moment because what the church has done in this last generation is make a religious term out of it that God never intended for it to be. You've heard strong man this and strong man that. That's not what Jesus is saying here. 
Okay. What he's saying is, is there's a physically powerful person that lives inside of a house. He goes, if you want to rob him, you're going to have to be stronger than him when you walk into his house, right? Yes. Make sense? So he's looking at it from a point of view of a criminal. You're going to walk into somebody's house and you're going to do him harm. You're going to have to be stronger than that person. He says, that's what I'm doing to Satan's house. I and my father are one. I am the son of God. I'm stronger than the devil. And that's why I'm able to drive out the power of the devil. Okay? That's what he's saying. He's not saying go around and call Satan strongman. Hmm. Again, Satan laughs. Because an analogy that Jesus was making, the church has turned into a doctrine. We have no idea what we're talking about. Strong man, I tear you down. He's like, you just called me strong. You see the problem there? You're just agreeing that I'm powerful. All right, bring it on. What do you got? You know, he's, he hasn't called us to get into the shouting match with the devil. He says, I am able to do this because I'm able to subdue the strong man. This is the authority and this is the power that I am giving you. So this is an analogy, not studying or establishing a theology uh, uh, of driving out the devil. Simply put, when driving out demons, you are using a force and a power greater than the demons have to stay where they are. You are dispossessing them from their current territory so that it can be possessed by the Spirit of God. It's in exchange. It has nothing to do really with you except for that you recognize and know that you're operating according to the authority of Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit. End of story. Make sense? Yes. All right, I want to show a brief video clip here. And so I'm going to let Josh get this set up. Uh, this is from a mission trip that we took um, uh, a few years back into Tanzania. And uh, we are in a village church, a very, very small church that we were invited to come uh, preach at. And uh, it's altar call time. So we've delivered the message and uh, uh, we're having a response there. And uh, you'll see in this clip when it's first, uh, first turning on, you'll see a, um, uh, me in the altar and I'm, uh, I'm praying for individuals like we always do. And then you'll see a, a young girl manifesting. And so I want you to, I want you to watch this real, real quick. Mm -hmm. Give us just a second here. One moment, please. I sprung it on him here at the last minute, so it's completely and totally my, my error. There it is. So there she is on the ground there. Can we make that bigger, Josh? Maybe get some volume here. So this is a clip explaining what, uh, what was happening. And is there any volume that'll come? Volume's all the way up. Let me see if this is working over here. I often get loud when I pray, just so you know. Hope that doesn't frighten anybody.
Okay. That's good, Josh. We can stop it there. So let me continue here with some of the story that maybe wasn't captured, I think, uh, in the volume. The woman speaks not one word of English. And yet when we came down to the end of seeing her set free, uh, the devil that was inside of her started crying out, say goodbye, say goodbye in English. In English, you know, knowing that it was about to be evicted. You know, we see this in every trip that we've been a part of. Uh, this is one that we just happened to get on camera. So it's, it's not a, a, a unique situation for us. But that's the power and the authority. You know what Christ has called you to do. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit to back it up. It's the work of God that does the work. That's what we're after. We're after something that will see souls set free, the gospel preached, and that will see, uh, see sicknesses buckle. It works the same way with a sickness as it does with a, with a demonic entity. It's no different. You are dispossessing something that has taken authority. You're dispossessing it. There is a battle that ensues. It's the same way when you are, when you are interceding. It's the exact same way. You'll feel that physical struggle and you'll have the knowledge that in the spiritual realm, I am dispossessing the power uh, and the authority of the enemy because this is the scope that God has given me. This is the territory that God has given me. I'm dispossessing it so that I can possess it for Christ. That's your work in prayer. That's the wrestling that you feel. That's what the terminology often is. You pray through a situation. You pray through to victory. That used to be something that people used to say all the time. Oh, I went down to the altar and I prayed through. They're getting that battle there. They're praying it until you've taken over that territory and you've dispossessed what has already, uh, uh, already been there. Um, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 16 tells about the woman who had been disabled for 18 years, uh, had a spirit that had disabled her for 18 years. She was bent over, not able to straighten herself up completely. I'm not going to go in this in great detail. I want you to see something. A spirit, a demonic power, an angel, a fallen angel, that's what demons are, okay? A fallen angel had disabled this woman for 18 years. She's bent over, not able to straighten herself up completely. Do you see that? You have a a bondage from hell that has physical ramifications. You understanding this? Not all sicknesses are simply sicknesses. A lot of it is oppression from the enemy. When Jesus says, Caesar, he doesn't pray, be healed. Why does he pray? Woman, you are freed from your disability or from your infirmity, from your weakness, from that, uh, that he disabled the power that was there disabling her evicted it from her life and then she was free. You're freed from your disability. It's spiritual warfare in one sentence. Woman, you are freed from your disability. He placed his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and she glorified God. Jesus released her. So here's the analogy again. There was a strong power that had held her captive. Jesus came in and tied him up and kicked him out so that she would be released and be free. That's the struggle that you're going through in intercession. Okay, this is power and authority. Authority comes from God, but there's also the power from God to untie the bondage. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. Uh, so this is a statement, and, and I don't have time to do this justice tonight. Uh, it's not necessarily talking about what a lot of people think it's talking about. Um, but I, I want to introduce some words here. Based on Peter's profession... I believe you are Messiah. I believe you are the Son of God. Okay, based on that profession, he says, well done. Uh, you've, you've said it right. You've got the right thing. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, so on and, for, and whatever you release on earth. These are two terms in Greek that mean something specific. To bind in rabbinical language is to forbid. So whatever you bind on heaven or, or bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you forbid. He's not saying that Peter then has, you know, omnipotent authority or omniscient authority or, or anything to do whatever he wants. He's talking about a specific realm of things. If you forbid something uh, spiritually in warfare, then it's forbidden. If you release it or loose it or permit it, then it's, uh, it's released. This is the power and the authority that Christ has given 
to his church to be about his business, not to bind people, not to bind things. You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a limited scope. 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God was revealed. Pay attention to this. In order to destroy the works of the devil. That's the mandate. You find something that's the work of the devil, you can destroy it through prayer. The strong man, if you will, or the one who is exercising power and authority to possess a certain thing can be driven out if the church will pray. The intercessor has the authority to destroy the works of the devil. This is our mandate from Jesus to undo the works of the devil. Sin's web, sin's confusion, sin's sicknesses, sin's discouragement, sin's depression, sin's oppression, sin's imprisonments, infirmities, limits, anything that can be attributed to the works of Satan in the human life, we have the authority to destroy, but you have to have the power to do so. Again, the sons of Sceva, they had the name of Jesus and they were using the name of Jesus. I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, I need to say one word about this before we get into prayer tonight about using the name of Jesus. I know it's a habit and hard habits are so hard to break, but you say it I say it after every prayer, you know, in the name of Jesus, amen. You know, in the name of Jesus, name. Do you understand what in the name of Jesus means? It's not a phrase. It's not an incantation. It's his authority. By his authority, by his character, by his essence, I'm saying and declaring this thing. That's it. Sometimes if I use something so long that it doesn't really have a good bite and a meaning, I think of a way to rephrase it. I bring this prayer by the authority and the character of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I look at it from a different way because the sons of Sceva had the name of Jesus, but it didn't do them any good. Okay? It must be said with the full conviction. It's not a tagline. It's not a motto. It's not a benediction to a, to a prayer. It's got to be said with the full conviction that when I'm saying this, I'm talking about the person and the character of Jesus who is omnipotent, who is omniscient, who loves his body and who has given me authority to work in his behalf in this realm. So that's what I'm saying this in. That's what I'm bringing this in. And that causes Satan to tremble. In a book, The Kneeling Christian, it tells of a 12-year-old boy in China named Ma Na Si. He came home from boarding school to spend some time with his father, and he was the son of what the local villagers called the Jesus Man. He was a local pastor, and they called him the Jesus Man. One day, he heard a horseman galloping up to him as he stood on the doorstep of his father's home. The man was a non-Christian was greatly agitated and wanted to see the Jesus man. Manasi explained that his father was away from home. The visitor became increasingly distressed and explained that there was a, a, a woman in his village who was being torn apart by demons and he had been sent to get the Jesus man to cast the demon out. The woman was raving and reviling and pulling out her hair, clawing her face, tearing her clothes, smashing up furniture, full of rage and foaming at the mouth. The 12-year-old boy kept explaining, my dad is not home. The pastor is not at home. The man dropped to his knees and cried out, you too are a Jesus man. Will you come? The boy made himself available to Jesus, thinking about young Samuel, and agreed to go with a stranger. The man mounted his horse, pulled the boy up on the horse, and they galloped away. On the way, Manasi began to pray. He searched his heart for guidance and ask God what to say, ask God how to act, trying to remember the portions of Bible in which Jesus cast out devils. Can you guys picture yourself in a similar position? Then he stilled his heart and he simply trusted in the God he knew, loving, powerful, merciful, and he asked Jesus be glorified. When they arrived at the house, several family members were forcibly restraining the woman upon the bed she had not been told that someone had gone to get the pastor, but when she heard the footsteps outside, she called out, All of you, get out of my way quickly so that I can escape. I must flee. A Jesus man is coming, and I cannot endure him. His name is Manasi. 
the boy entered the room, having heard that outburst, sung a hymn, and in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, glorified and omnipotent, he commanded the demon to come out of the woman. Instantly she was calm, and from that day on she was perfectly well. A 12-year-old boy. We're not talking about decades of experience. We're not talking about decades of higher education. We're not talking about he's been on millions of mission trips. We're talking about the authority that simply he knew the loving Christ that he served gave him to drive out devils. And he asked God, help me. And Jesus be glorified. That's what demons are afraid of. That's power and that's authority. The disciples were given this authority after a brief period of interaction with Jesus. The foundation of asking God through the name of Jesus is accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit while rooted in the motivation of advancing the kingdom of God. That's how authority works. Authority and power have to be interwoven together. Meditate on the glory of God. Know the word of God. Hear his voice and then act on what we know. What does John 15, 4 say? Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch is not able to bear fruit from itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. Power in Christianity, power in prayer comes from remaining in the presence of Jesus. Power is always associated with intimacy, listening to God, and obeying what we hear. You will bear fruit. You will bear more fruit. You will bear much fruit if you surrender yourself to the hands of God to prune you and to cut away the things that get in the way and the hindrances that get in the way and simply say, Lord, I want to receive the authority that you've given me and I want to know the power of the Holy Spirit with which you have provided me to do this work. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, and to the furthest parts of the earth. You cannot be a witness of Jesus without the power of Jesus. How can you testify of Jesus and the things of Jesus and the things that he did without his power? It's impossible. You can tell a story about Jesus, but you can't be a witness. You can't witness to what he's done. You can't be uh, someone who, who demonstrates that who he is is still alive until you get a hold of this power and this power gets a hold of you. It's that power that backs up the authority that God's given you. That's what's missing. An element that's missing in intercession and in the church. People want to see visions and they want to see dreams and they want to command this and they want to command that. I hope that what we've been able to do here in this session is to take some of these things that we've heard about power and authority, demystify them, and bring them back to the realm of the simplistic. Yes. God's given you authority. He wants you to have authority. It's for a limited scope. Preaching the gospel, driving out devils, and healing the sick. That's it, advancing his kingdom, undoing the works of the devil where you see him, okay? That's the authority that God's given his, his church, but it comes with power. The power has to be gained as well or all you're doing is speaking to the air. I am tired of the church speaking to the air about the things of God and the world and Satan laughing because there's no power to enforce it. This is what we're after. We're trying to restore the credibility of the church. God's credibility isn't broken. He's God. But the credibility of us who follow Him and witness Him and say this is what we are about, it is destroyed because we haven't gotten back to the basics of what Christ has called us to do. When you stand pray, when you kneel pray, when you're asking God to do something, there is no room here for, well, if it's your will, you need to know the will of God before you begin to pray. You need to know ahead of time. Well, if you want to do this, I don't know. I know sometimes you just take people to heaven and you don't really heal them. And I know sometimes people, you've talked yourself out of doing the work that God's given you the authority to do. Amen. You have to stand in that power and in that authority. You are an intercessor, a priest of God. He has given you the ability to carry the name of Jesus and carry that essence and that character. His reputation is at stake, not yours. You put yourself in that position where you're saying, God, I will not have your reputation solely, not on my watch, not in my generation. You've given me authority until I figure this out, until I know how this works. Lord, you, you rake me over the coals, do whatever you've got to do.
to do, rid of fence from my life, but I am determined I am going to present a better picture of you to my generation than the generation before is presented. We're going to have intercessors that stand and they walk in the authority and the power of Christ and we're going to do great exploits for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? All right, we're going to stop here tonight. Thank you so much again for uh, watching. Those that are reviewing this online, please share this uh, and uh, and uh, on your Facebook pages and let all the pastors, Pastor Bopani, with all those pastors there, make sure they're getting a hold of this material. Uh, you too, Pastor Eric there in uh, Mombasa with Pastor Doreen and others. Make sure they're getting a hold of this material. It's uh, required viewing and uh, uh, for, for those that are going to, to be ordained here with, uh, with Omega. Okay, God bless you and uh, look forward to, uh, to visiting with you again soon.